In animation, colorful rounded fabric squares converge, spiraling upward. Ability Summit. We are back with our third and final round of Keynote Contact. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny's Jenny wearing a black shirt that says accessibility on. is a human We've right. so much already and truly built on the pillars of imagine, build and include. If you choose to share on social, please use the hashtag and Ability Summit. And because we're always working to make this event as accessible as possible, don't hesitate to drop questions into the chat. A reminder, Keynote and breakout content will be available after today's event on demand, so you can watch at a pace and a time that works for you. Now, we all know that disability is a part of the human experience. It is intersectional and it will impact most at some point in your lifetime, which is why this panel is so special. Microsoft's Alexia Claiborne, Director of Inclusion and Accessibility here in our events team, leads a powerhouse discussion with community leaders whose families shaped the American civil rights movement. And what a better place to do that than in the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. An aerial welcome, view of Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Home of the blues and birthplace of rock and roll. Also, welcome to the Lorraine Motel, home of the Civil Rights Museum. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it straight when he uttered the words, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. We gathered in Memphis to model what community engagement can look like. On stage, black and African-American leaders whose families changed the world. In direct conversation with community stakeholders, these are just some of the highlights. So there's so much history up here alive today. Alexia has dark hair, past, glasses, and a black jacket. The present and the future. And the magnificent Deborah Watts, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation and also cousin of Emmett Till. Emmett Till, for those of you who do not know, was a 14-year-old black boy from Chicago who was visiting his family in Mississippi. He was brutally murdered, and for many, he is considered to be the catalyst that started the modern civil rights movement. Dr. Michelle Taylor, she is a native Memphian and the director of the Division of Health Services for Shelby County. Natasha Bell, who is the co-founder of the 1687 Club. The 1687 Club is a technology organization that focuses on social good projects using Microsoft development tools. Four of the panelists up here are members. Rosalind Withers is the executive director of the Withers Art Gallery, also a native Memphian. Her father, was Dr. Ernest C. Withers, who had the privilege of leaving our community with 1.8 million images that documents our story, that tell through pictures a history that spans over 60 years. Rena Evers Everett, who is the executive director of the Megger Murley Evers Foundation. She is the daughter, and Rena has said the proud daughter <laughs> of uh, Megger and Queen Merle Evers. <laughs> For those of y'all who aren't familiar with Megger Evers, Megger was a civil rights giant from Mississippi. He was integral in strategy leading to voting rights and integrating schools in Mississippi, as well as being the first field chair of the NAACP in Mississippi before he was assassinated in 1963. I want to say that, you know, we are, from a Microsoft perspective, we are, you know, honored to be here having this conversation with this audience, with both of these communities, both uh, the Black, African-American, and disability communities. Some folks may not be aware of the uh, intersection between uh, race and disability with Emmett Till. I um, do want to say that Emmett Till, who at age 14, um, vibrant young man who lost his life, of course, um, but started out in life uh, with polio and then also started out with life struggling with a stuttering problem. 
Uh, so that um, was limiting in nature of the expectations of him. But he certainly was able to overcome that with the love of his mother, the love and the embrace of the community, and all of those that understood that he needed a equal chance in life just like everyone else. My own uh, disability is invisible. Um, I have um, uh, both of my ankles have pins and screws in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so mobility is a challenge for me personally. Deborah but has again, dark hair like and a red women, shirt. And like anyone else, um, we are looking for that equal chance and opportunity to contribute um, without the barriers that are set in place or without the expectations that um, others have of our inability to engage and to provide value. I am just more than excited to be with all of the community. Rena has dark hair and a black jacket. My sister's up here on the dais. All of you in the audience, all of you out in the virtual audience, it's special. You heard magic put out. It is magical. And I'm dyslexic. And it's a struggle. Um, I can't say I've mastered it, but I'm working on it. Through that understanding of being labeled in school that you're slow or that you can't rise up above it, it challenged me to do the best that I could do. And that's what we all have to do. What are some of the lessons learned from the civil rights work that your father was a part of that you continue that can inform how we fight and make progress for everyone uh, amplifying the disability community? So often we are erased. So often we are in a, in a position where we are told that our history is not important, that we don't count or that we are a threat. But when you have the evidence of its existence, what comes with that is a foundation for our youth to know who we are. Rosalind that has dark hair and a black and gold shirt. Who we are. And it's visual, and that builds strong communities when you know who you are and where you come from. How does mental health impact specific disenfranchised or underrepresented communities like the Black African-American community uh, and people with disabilities? Disability of mental health comes in so many forms. I'll take the Teal story, for instance. What's... Um, difficult about that is that it's been over 68 years. 68, mm -hmm. yes. This, this family year. has no closure. With all the evidence, with all the proof that comes with knowing that this existed, the trauma that comes in their family of not getting that closure of justice is difficult. What we just finished talking about Long-standing trauma, trauma from racism, trauma from discrimination, trauma from health inequities, trauma from lack of access, yeah. trauma from all manner of things. Michelle Living has red hair and a dark black suit. And brown skin in the United States, and particularly in the South, um, has stayed with us. And we are seeing that borne out in our children, our grandchildren, within the African-American community. We have to start doing a better job of being transparent about what mental health or mental disability may look like. Usually when you have one disability, you have a few, especially learning disabilities. So I had a few, um, but one of the ones that I think that left an impact on my life was a speech impediment. And so my mother um, put me in speech therapy in around the third grade. And I just remember walking to that class, being separated from my classmates and having to walk to speech therapy. And it was only until the sixth grade that I was done with speech therapy. They had helped me overcome my uh, list. And um, 
I'm sitting in class going to that hour and realize that's English. And I realize I'm like, man, I haven't gone to English class all the way until the sixth grade because I was going to speech therapy. And so um, one of the things that the intersectionality between the community and disability is that oftentimes inclusion is the very tool used for exclusion. There are literal schools that are schools of inclusion and they would be 98% minority. Natasha has long dark age, hair and, and a green and it, jacket. And it's a very tool used for exclusion. And so we have got to marry our efforts with tech to make sure that we guard against human error, human biases. I think we can use technology and AI to make sure that we watch the data. And even I recently found out that even artificial intelligence can have biases in the code. And these are going to be the things that are used uh, to w see whether or not who can purchase homes, who has credit. And so we as a community have to get into the tech space because we have to be on guard and say, hey, these things can't happen here too. I really was struck by something that our distinguished panelists said. Um, about owning your intellectual property, owning how you tell the history. Whenever I get business leaders ask me, well, what can I do now to do something in the community? One of the things I tell them is learn about the history of your organization before 1968, if it existed before 1968. Shelby County Health Department has existed in some form since 1838. Up until 1972, our birth and death certificates were color categorized by race. So orange cards for African-Americans, white cards for whites, and yellow cards for infants that were born stillborn. And for my elected officials and people who have been elected officials, you know that vital records are very important for what you pay for in the community. So there couldn't have been any other reason to color categorize those vital records, except you needed to decide what your allocation was gonna be based on the number of births of African-Americans and whites in the community. Remember, state of Tennessee didn't go electronic until the 1990s. So a lot of us who grew up here had to go into the card catalog, you pull the card, then you go to the book. And they said most African-Americans in the book have the equivalent of what you know as a short form. First name, last name, date of birth. So the death certificate, death, date. That's it. When you pull a white residence card, they have the equivalent of a long form. All that information I just said, plus address, maybe what your mom and dad did for a living as an occupation, all the things. So even from the day you came into the world until the day you died, your worth was determined by what was on that card. And the worth was not equitable. It was not equal. So when we have our panelists up here telling you how important it is that Microsoft is engaged in this work, that tech is really taking the idea, some folks in tech have taken the idea that this is important. It is important for us to own our stories, to tell our stories. How do your intersecting identities between race and disability shape how you move through the world? Understanding the historical trauma that is permeating through many of our black and brown communities. So I carry that weight. Uh, it is a heavy lift in a lot of instances to move through life with all of those things that intersect that could be barriers. The other thing I do wanna say is that um, we don't talk about those things that, we inter that are intersected in our lives, do we? We walk around and someone may say, um, look at the beautiful Rena down at the end of the stage there, may, may not know her story. We don't walk around with our stories, do we? So it's so important to have opportunities to share them as we talked about storytelling uh, because those intersections are those things that make us brilliant and unique. Those things that, that are part of the things that intersect with us are the things that give us power, 
give us presence. We have heard such palpable thought leadership from this panel on the intersection between race and disability. So thank you all so much for joining us in this conversation. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to the in-person audience. Thank you to everyone watching virtually. Thank you to so many who made this moment possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Powerful, right? An intersectional approach is utterly crucial to how we think about disability inclusion and accessibility. And with that, we pivot to the conversation that we have been teasing all day. Our president and vice chair of Microsoft, Brad Smith, speaking with US Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, to discuss transportation, disability rights, and accessibility as a fundamental right. Roll on. Brad Smith you, has Jenny. blonde Mr. hair and Secretary, a dark thank jacket. Thank you so much for joining us, for joining this important community of people, more than 20,000 people from more than 100 countries around the world. At Microsoft, we often think and talk about the issues that people with disabilities face. As you know, there's more than one in seven people around the world that have some kind of disability, temporary or permanent. And I think increasingly the world is recognizing that people have a fundamental right to accessibility. That's something I think you've long stood up for. I would love to start with your role today as Secretary of Transportation for the United States. How do you think about the issues for people with disabilities in this context? Pete has brown hair and a dark uh, jacket. Thanks for having me, and I'm, I'm really glad to be with you. Uh, look, this is one of the real tests, I think, of whether we as a country are doing a good job at doing uh, what policy is supposed to do, which is tear down the obstacles of any kind that stand between people and a life of their choosing. One of the most basic things you need in order to thrive is the ability to get around, to access uh, opportunities for work, for education, uh, to be with loved ones, and uh, to do anything else that uh, is meaningful in life that requires you uh, to go from one place to another. And so we view our responsibilities as the Department of Transportation uh, as making good on that fundamental right, as you put it, uh, which is exactly how we view uh, access. I would add one more thing, which is that now, when we do get that right, uh, one of the results is that the entire country is stronger. Uh, this benefits not just the one in seven Americans who uh, currently uh, have a disability uh, or the many, many more Americans who at some point will age into disability, uh, but it benefits the country and every community because people not only are better off when they can get to where they need to be, but they're better able to contribute. A community, a society, a country that does not enable people to get to where they need to be for education, work, or other purposes, is also denying itself the full benefit of what they have to offer. And that's why everybody, whether they realize it or not, uh, has a stake in making sure that our transportation systems are as accessible as they can be, and much more accessible, frankly, than they have been in the past. One of the things that I think is so interesting about the United States, perhaps less well known for people who might be watching this from other countries, is that because of the size of our country, we've long been not just connected, but almost defined by the nation's transportation infrastructure. George Washington was not only the first president, he was one of the first proponents of building canals to start to bind the, connection, the, the country together. We've gone through successive waves of highways and railroad lines and airlines. And in many ways, I think the Biden administration and you and your role have really blazed a new historical moment for our country with the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, passed in 2021 with bipartisan support. I think it's more than fair to say that it did more to serve people with disabilities than any infrastructure act in America's history. But can you talk to us a little bit about how you approach that and what you see as the important accomplishments in that piece of legislation? Well, you mentioned the, the historic context of the work that we're doing. Uh, and if you think back at certain key moments in America coming together, they were largely driven by advances in transportation technology, whether it was the transcontinental railroad completed during Abraham Lincoln's administration that helped finally make this a coast-to-coast -coast connected country, 
uh, to the, the interstate highway system and the way that that Eisenhower era construction uh, really uh, took to a whole new level, the extent to which our country really felt like one country. And uh, we view that as important context for the work we're doing right now. This Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as it's formally known, I think most people just call it the infrastructure law, uh, is truly historic in its proportions. The most we've done for, uh, for roads and highways since the Eisenhower administration, the most we've done for trains since Amtrak itself was, was created, the most we've done for transit uh, ever uh, as, as a federal government. And one of the most important principles through all of that work is making sure that in this generation's round of improvements and transformations to our transportation infrastructure, it's more accessible than it was in the past. And we're doing that not just with encouragement, but, but with dollars. Uh, we're funding things like a program called ASAP, All Station Accessibility Program. Uh, this was uh, driven by uh, uh, several advocates, including Senator Tammy Duckworth. And the idea is to make sure that uh, we are funding making rail and transit user uh, stations more accessible to all users and finally bring them into full compliance with the ADA. $1.7 billion going into this. We've already announced our first round of grants to health transit stations, often those legacy systems. Some of the first ones to build, uh, unfortunately, for that very reason, uh, have been some of the last to become fully accessible because of that older uh, architecture and, and setup. Uh, we can change that, and we are changing that with funding. Our airport terminal grants, uh, $5 billion in this package for improving uh, airports. Uh, and just in this last round uh, of the uh, 83 uh, grants that we've given out to improve the experience of moving through an airport, uh, about 85% uh, uh, of them, 75 of those, uh, have features that are going to make those airport terminals more accessible to people with disabilities. Um, there's even a, a provision in the legislation that uh, requires that someone with a disability be on the board of directors of Amtrak. Uh, there's funding for safety uh, that uh, bears vulnerable uh, road users in mind and helps uh, with things like curb cuts and sidewalks and uh, safety that, that matters in particular to people navigating that system with disabilities. And we're working to make sure that uh, not just our specialized grant programs, but all of the funding that we put out, that we're in dialogue with the states that are getting a lot of that money by formula and deploying it to uh, work through their list of, of, of projects that have long been needed on everything from, from tunnels and to, to bridges, uh, to make sure that it is designed in ways that are truly accessible and, and, and universal for all. We live in an interesting technological age. Obviously, folks who are watching this from Microsoft or across the tech sector live with that every day. I think we're also living in an age when technology is really changing transportation. From your vantage point, you just see every aspect of this nation's, and really, I think, probably the world's transportation connectivity. Where do you see technology taking the future of transportation in the coming years? Well, I think we are at a moment of extraordinary transformation. I think there's a, a likelihood that in the 2020s, uh, we, we will, uh, when we're looking back at the 2020s, we'll, we'll view this period as one of the most transformative for transportation since the uh, the arrival of the jet age or, or the arrival of, uh, of, of cars uh, 50 years before that. And at the same time, we have some humility about being able to predict how those changes will unfold. After all, if you look at the most important piece of transportation technology of the last decade, arguably it was the smartphone, which isn't even a vehicle or on board a vehicle, and yet it changed so many things from how we navigate to how we summon rides. Uh, but we do know certain things are emerging, notably including artificial intelligence, which could bring great benefit, but not automatically. We need to be really smart about how to shape these technological innovations and uh, respond to them as not interesting for their own sake, but interesting because they could solve some of our biggest problems. Uh, enhancements to vehicle intelligence could solve some of our biggest problems around safety, uh, especially in the US where we experience roughly 40,000 road deaths a year, and could certainly be transformative from the perspective of accessibility and making sure that uh, there are more ways for people with disabilities to get around. And we're doing what we can to spur this kind of innovation too, including a 
an inclusive design challenge that we've sponsored uh, with $5 million to uh, encourage innovation in automated vehicle accessibility uh, and design. And uh, we've just announced uh, the winners uh, in uh, in the middle of last year and are going to continue to draw on the expertise of, of researchers and advocates and the disability community to look at how we can make the most of these emerging technologies. Uh, again, not just for their own sake, not just because they're exciting or, or uh, or inspiring to, to look at and think about, uh, but because they could really make concrete differences in what it's like for people to get from where they are to where they need to be. You talked about the impact of the airplane, you know, how airlines just connect this country, they connect the world. Uh, you know, they're just, I think, indispensable for life in the world today. Uh, and yet you've also spoken, I think, not just elegant, eloquently, but passionately, about what it means for someone who has a wheelchair to get on an airplane today. Uh, unlike a bus, uh, unlike a train, uh, people have to give up their wheelchair. And unfortunately, as you've also pointed out, not everybody gets it back in the same condition at the other end of the flight. More than a thousand wheelchairs are basically damaged beyond repair each year in the United States. What can you offer, what can the country offer in terms of some hope for people who use a wheelchair and need to get on an airplane? Well, this is an incredibly frustrating experience for wheelchair users who have found again and again that their wheelchairs are damaged uh, or that they have uh, an experience that's just not uh, uh, in, in terms of function and in terms of dignity, uh, not what they deserve. And uh, you, you hear it from uh, friends, from colleagues, uh, and from advocates who have had this experience. It's why we issued the Airline Passengers with Disabilities Bill of Rights to make sure uh, there's a broad understanding and empowerment uh, about things that you can ask for uh, from the gate agent, things that you can seek uh, and insist on right now as a, as a, a traveler with disability uh, based on the rules that we have and the rules that we enforce. We're not stopping there. Uh, we need to continue developing that regulatory framework. Uh, for example, uh, we've been moving forward on a rulemaking about lavatories in single aisle aircraft, making those accessible. Too many travelers have the experience even of dehydrating themselves just because of what they uh, know they uh, uh, they will not get in terms of adequate uh, uh, accessible laboratory lavatories on board. Uh, we're launching a rulemaking to help ensure safe accommodations for, for air travelers who are using wheelchairs and advancing a research roadmap uh, to look into the future and how uh, we can make sure that, uh, that there's a better framework across the entire aviation system uh, for all travelers with disabilities and certainly those using wheelchairs. We're also going to expand our own compliance and enforcement activities uh, because the Air Carrier Access Act uh, does create a lot of very important tools on this. And the bottom line is, is uh, again, friends and colleagues have, uh, have expressed very uh, memorably and candidly is if uh, an airline gets you there, but your wheelchair doesn't arrive in working condition, it is as if a traveler has arrived where they need to be without their legs. And that's uh, unacceptable reality, uh, especially knowing that uh, access to air travel is important for people's jobs, uh, for their livelihoods, and, and for the ability to uh, fully participate in this country. And again, uh, to, to my uh, uh, the point that I made at the, at the beginning, it's also important for people to, to be able to contribute the most that they can uh, to their families, their communities, to our country. I think that's really well put. And um, I, we really appreciate the way you are thinking about and addressing that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you a little bit about is how the public and private sectors really best come together when we think about the nation's transportation. It is a fascinating web, I think, of you know, public investments, private airlines, uh, others, people drive their own cars. Uh, as a company that provides digital technology, we're working ever more closely, I think, with cities like New York and Chicago. But as you look at the nation as a whole, what do you see as the role of public and private partnership when it comes to improving the country's transportation infrastructure? Well, a healthy public-private uh, relationship and partnership is absolutely integral to our transportation system working well. Uh, most of our transportation systems, whether we're talking about supply chains for moving goods or whether we're talking about means for moving people, uh, are in private hands, uh, or they are a combination of private and public. Uh, private aircraft uh, with a private airline operating in airspace managed by uh, public air traffic control privately owned vehicle uh, driving across a highway that is uh, owned and, and operated by uh, uh, by government. 
uh, waterways uh, that are overseen and regulated by, uh, uh, by authorities, but uh, navigated by private entities. And this is especially true as we look at the innovation and transformation that's ahead. Uh, you know, there's uh, all the way back to things like uh, the invention of the internet, which I think is a great example uh, of something that came out of public R&D. But of course, taking the internet and uh, maximizing and realizing its full potential was something that happened when that uh, publicly created research then was able to unfurl in, uh, in the private sector. And that's how we view a lot of the work that we do here as well. Uh, we will help with basic research. And then as the private sector uh, carries these transformational technologies to their full potential, we'll be there to make sure that it unfolds in a way that is, first of all, and most importantly, safe, uh, and also that is accessible, that benefits shared goals ranging from economic strength uh, to uh, helping us meet our climate challenge. All of those things are possible if and only if we make sure that uh, there is a healthy balance between the, the activities that, that we uh, as a government and the public sector carry on and the activities that the private sector does best. And it's, again, a dynamic, exciting time to be doing just that. And it's one of the reasons why uh, I think there's never been a better time to be working in transportation. Well, I think that's a great note on which to end. I think there's never been a better time to have the kind of leadership you're providing to the Department of Transportation and for the country, not just because transportation is evolving, but as we've discussed, uh, I think we appreciate more clearly today than at any point in the nation's history the importance of serving people with disabilities, addressing the fundamental right, the civil right that it is for these individuals in this country to be able to benefit from mobility. We are very fortunate to have you in your office today uh, and across the country every day. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Great being with you. Thank you, Brad. Jenny's and wearing a T-shirt that says the future is accessible. Amazing conversation. Next, we're going to share with you Halion's approach to empowering customers who are blind or low vision. We're going to check out some audio-first tech that makes health products far more accessible. And I want you to meet two amazing people who are the driving force behind it. First, Tamara Rogers, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Halion, and Saqib Sheikh, uh, who leads our Seeing AI team. And I mean, this is not your first time here um, at Microsoft. But before we dig in, let's roll the clip. A woman feels around in a bathroom sink. Animated healthcare products sing and dance. You could pick a wrong product and not realize. Or worse, you're allergic and break into hives. Wait, break into hives? Uh, Always read the label, that's what they say. But not everybody reads the same old way. We need a solution to help people today. And with the Seeing AI app, we found a way. Now you can always read the label even if you can't. You can always read the label even if you can't. Cause our barcodes have been enhanced into access codes for speak when you scan. Yeah. Now you can always read the label even if you can't. You can always read the label even if you can't. Cause our barcodes have been enhanced into access codes for speak when you scan. Download the Seeing AI app and scan Halion barcodes to hear spoken product information. Halion for health with humanity. Isn't that fun? So my first question, hi there, Tamara. Tell us a little bit hi. how this all came about and how accessibility is this priority at Halion. Tamara has brown yeah, so hair and a black and white patterned shirt. People can buy and do to manage their own everyday health, so things like Sensodyne and Centrum. But we recognize that despite amazing improvements in medicine, data, technology, Better everyday health just remains elusive for too many people. So we've made a commitment to championing health inclusivity or creating more opportunities for people to be included in everyday health. And our goal is to reach 50 million people a year by 2025. Now, to help us reach this goal, we've identified three major barriers that we think we're well placed to help tackle. One of them is healthcare accessibility which I mean, you know, being able to get appropriate access uh, and being that being available for all healthcare products and services. Now, clearly it's the right thing to do. And we have approximately 1 billion people globally living with some form of disability. So the more that we can do to help everybody be able to access our products, the better. 
It's a huge undertaking. And when we were thinking about how we could drive accessibility, we were keen to collaborate with others where possible. And we thought, well, Microsoft are world leaders in tech. Alien are world leaders in healthcare. So between us, we have the potential to enable millions of people who live with sight loss or even health literacy, so that you know, having trouble reading quite complicated medicine, medicinal language, to be able to better access our products and take better care of their health. That's so amazing, and I, I love it to get it to everyone and all. I think it's got to be the right goal. Now, the, the disability I know community itself has been really important to how to think about, create, and innovate. And feedback is always that secret source. How's Halion using that data, those insights, to help inform what you do going forward? How did it help on this project? Yeah, insight is everything. So whenever we develop any project, actually, we really think about how do we, first of all, understand where we can make a difference? And you need data and insight to know where to put and direct your efforts. And for Seeing AI, we found that in the UK alone, where I am here today, more than 2 million people are living with sight loss. But there's also 7 million people, which is 16% of UK adults, have got low levels of literacy. So there's a sizable population here struggling with accessing healthcare correctly. Uh, in addition to those living with sight loss, um, they, the ones, sorry, those people who, who do live with sight loss were telling us that they struggle with self-administering medications. In fact, a, stagger, a staggering 73% face challenges, with 46 of them saying that they have previously taken the wrong dosage. Now, that clearly is not what we want to be have happening. So this is really compelling for us, and so this collaboration was born. And uh, as we developed um, the enhancements to the Seeing AI app, uh, as well as developing the Always Read the Label campaign that you just saw, we actually consulted with members of the Royal National Institute of Blind People in the UK. And with that feedback and really understanding amongst the community kind of what was working, what was needed, we were able to understand that this was a big step forward, really in um, unlocking greater interdependence for those living with sight loss to be able to take care of themselves. So. We continue monitoring feedback, and we would love this to be something we keep iterating and building on. Thank you, Tamara. My goodness. All right, Sakib, thank you for joining us here in the studio. Now, this must have been a really cool experience, working together with a brand like Halion. Tell us about it. What was it being, what was this like as both the leader of Seeing AI? You were the innovator, the one behind this thing back in 2017 when it launched, and also a blind consumer. What was the experience like? It's really Sakip has dark amazing, hair and blue especially shirt. Especially to see the commitment Halion has to inclusive healthcare. And Seeing AI has been able to recognize millions of products since we launched. But what you have here is a manufacturer who's been giving us the up-to-date, accurate information. And as a blind consumer, what I hear is exactly what the manufacturer wanted me to hear. So it's more rich, it's more accurate, and it's been great to bring that to um, all customers through Seeing AI. Now, Sakib, I know you, and I know that you're always working on something new for Seeing AI and charting the roadmap and the future. What do you want to share? What's coming up? Come on, you've got to dish a little bit. Oh my goodness, what do I have to choose? But I think for Seeing AI, it's always been about talking to our customers, understanding what are the challenges people face? What are the solutions we can develop? And the scientists at Microsoft, you know, what's the cutting edge tech we can play with? And one thing we've been working on is indoor navigation. People told us, okay, maybe you've um, moved offices in a big building and you want to find your way along a new route. So someone can record that route to you using audio augmented reality and message it to you so that you can follow it just by listening for the audio cues and following that route. So that's been an incredible experiment we're launching with customers today available from the app at seeingai.com. So that's been a really cool experience developing that with customers. All right, you heard it first. Indoor navigation on Seeing AI. But I, I got to, I know there's more. I know you've got more than one thing in your bucket ready to go. What else is coming up? Oh, yeah. So looking um, out to the future, we're definitely looking towards Android so we can bring this to other markets, to more customers. Really want to help as many people as possible. And AI, you know, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the key part of Seeing AI. Um, 
today we're launching some improvements to how we describe photos and over the upcoming weeks we're going to be refreshing the AI across the whole app because my goodness it's an incredible time for artificial intelligence and just looking at the things that are possible you're going to see some really exciting things coming up. Thank you, Saki, for everything that you do and leading the future with this pretty fun roadmap. And a big thank you to Tamara joining us from across the pond in London, which was snowing this morning. Um, I love how this is leading the future through partnership, and I'm, I get really excited about where this is going. But we are now going to switch gears. Voice recognition technology has empowered people with disabilities to engage with the world in a more seamless way but there is so much more to be done. Let's learn more about the cross-industry effort to level up speech recognition technology. Hi, I'm Clarian Mendes, and I'm a speech language pathologist and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Speech and Hearing Science at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Clarion has dark hair and is wearing a the green speech shirt. The Speech Accessibility Project is an interdisciplinary initiative with one shared goal to improve speech technology for people with a range of diverse speech patterns and disabilities. Led by the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign with support from Amazon, Apple, Google, Meta, and Microsoft, the project brings together technologists, academic researchers, and community organizations to create the diverse speech data needed to make spoken interfaces more accessible for everyone. My name is Mark Hasegawa Johnson. I'm the William Everett Faculty Fellow and a professor of electrical and computer engineering and a full-time faculty member at the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Mark Beckman has brown Institute hair and is wearing a white shirt. For the purpose of bringing together researchers from many different colleges and many different departments around the University of Illinois. The, um, the Beckman Institute is the ideal place for the speech accessibility project because Making speech technology that works better for people with disabilities requires expertise from people in linguistics and from people in speech and hearing science and from people in engineering and from people in information technology. And there are not very many places in, in the country, in the world perhaps, where you can bring together all of those different disciplines and have them um, sit down together and, and meet together in order to solve problems of the kinds that we're facing. Speech recognition is powered by machine learning, and without diverse representative data, machine learning models cannot learn how to understand a diversity of speech patterns. This project aims to change that by creating the data sets needed to effectively train these machine learning models. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Kevin Kwok. Uh, I am a person living with Parkinson's for the last 14 years. Uh, I've also had the fortune of being on the board of the Davis Finney Foundation, an organization uh, designed to help people like myself live well with Parkinson's today. When I was still employed, uh, um, my IT department was, they were trying to give me various voice activation tools uh, or software to try to help. But I found most of those had limitations. Uh, for instance, if I were to use dictation uh, software, I would spend more time having to go back and correct all the mistakes that were made. And when you don't have fingers that work with any dexterity, to go back and, and edit is in fact more work than you actually can imagine. Kevin's wearing so, a dark gray sweater. While as I, I love the fact that tools and voice recognition are out there, I, I don't think they're there yet to really fully accurately pick up the nuances of someone's speech deficits like my own. Hi, I'm Polly Dawkins, Executive Director of the Davis Finney Foundation for Parkinson's. We are located in Boulder, Colorado, but we serve a national and global community of people living with Parkinson's. Polly's a Caucasian the woman with light brown with hair. The University of Illinois is really exciting to the Davis Finney Foundation and to the Parkinson's community. I watch people with Parkinson's attempt to use their cell phones, their tablets, and other technology, and they can't do it very effectively because their hands don't work well. 
to then try to pick up a piece of technology and use a voice recording and then not have the voice recorded accurately, not even be understood at all, starts to shut somebody down and has a person withdraw from communication, withdraw from their families, withdraw from community. If we can come up with a way that people with Parkinson's can start to re-engage using their voice, it would be absolutely life-changing. If you or your organization are interested in getting involved, please sign up. We have begun recruiting participants from the Parkinson's community. Visit our website to learn more. My entire career has been in the um, pharmaceutical industry where we try to design new drugs to treat the issues facing patients today. And this is across 30 years of my career. The, the question is, am I optimistic? Well, when you think about the time frame that it requires to develop a new drug, it's decades. And it's not just short-term years. I would hope that with technology, with the bright companies and the bright individuals that are all getting behind it, it's that marriage of technology and wellness and healthcare that you can provide tools to us today um, for living better than it, than it requires the pharmaceutical industry decades to develop a medication. So I'm maybe even more optimistic about technology companies getting behind this. The Speech Accessibility Project is a multi-year research initiative. This will take time, but we've started something big and we want you to be a part of it. That was fantastic. Jenny's we wearing a black so, t-shirt that says Boundless Team Gleason. Through video games, people are able to connect, to gain insights into different perspectives and of course, have fun. With over 427 million players with disabilities, million gamers, it's critical that gaming remains a space that is safe, inclusive, and welcoming to all. Here with more is the Corporate Vice President of Xbox Operations and a dear friend to accessibility, Dave McCarthy. Dave, all yours. Dave has blonde hair and is wearing a blue sweater. story and thoughts on gaming accessibility. Welcome, Mike. How's it going? 
It's going great. Thank you for being here. Now we better start with an intro so people know, I know who you are, but introduce yourself to the crowd, share who you are and what you do. Sure. Hi. Uh, well, my name is Mike Luckett. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I am a retired U.S. Army veteran. And unfortunately, I was in a motorcycle accident and became a C6 quadriplegic. But more importantly, I'm a gamer and a Twitch streamer. And what I do there is I advocate for accessibility in gaming, uh, for people with spinal cord injuries, by creating content online, and being a peer mentor um, for the community of spinal cord injuries. Awesome. Thanks for sharing Mike's that, Mike. wearing and a black hey, hat, glasses, a gamer, and a purple shirt. Here. What do you like to play? And can you share a little bit about the setup that you actually use to play? Currently, I'm playing a lot of Apex Legends. Uh -huh. I feel like that is one of the hardest games to learn with just the mechanics of it the movement of the game, and just the overall competitive nature um, that's around, uh, revolves around in the community. But my setup, it's a little bit different than what most people would think when you're thinking of a con traditional controller setup. I have everything on a lap desk that fits about a 15-inch laptop, and I use two controllers. And the controllers that I use are the Xbox Adaptive Controller, and the Xbox Elite 2 controller. And they work both simultaneously through the co-pilot system. And with the switches that are actually attached to the Xbox adaptive controller, they're the buttons from the Logitech adaptive gaming kit. And they allow me to basically create a custom setup all on this lap desk, and then I Velcro all the buttons onto that lap desk. And I'm able to play any type of game. Now with the Elite controller, I actually swap the triggers. So it allows me to shoot with the left trigger and aim down sights with the right trigger. But I don't necessarily use the right trigger on the controller. I use the Xbox adaptive controller and replace um, the left trigger with the button that I use with my forearm. And this setup, it allows me to be competitive in first person shooters and it serves as like my default setup for playing any Xbox game. That's great. How's your uh, Tiger Woods golf game? I'm uh, pretty good on the golf course. I mean, I'm waiting for what's the, the next uh, Tiger Woods that comes out. I'm, I'm ready to hit the golf course. Let's, let's go and do it. Yeah, with that I'm setup you've got, I'm a little scared actually to go head to head. I actually <laughs> am never, you know, it ceases to amaze me the amount of customization our players are able to do. And it's really cool to see you and your setup there. Um, can you share, you know, where your passion for gaming actually comes from? Started as a kid, like a lot of gamers uh, usually say, but um, growing up, gaming allowed me to be anyone I wanted. You know, I could have been a plumber that saved their loved one from a fire-breathing spiky turtle. I was able to be a UNSC Spartan saving humanity from the Covenant. Um, it allowed me to live out adventures only my imagination could fathom. And since my injury over a decade ago, gaming has become a focal point in giving access to people like myself. Um, access to recreation, access for therapy, to a social life, and the end goal, a sense of independence. I love hearing it. That's why we work in gaming, is it means so many things to so many people. Why would you say that accessibility is so important in the gaming space? Put in an example, I feel like accessibility is like this automatic sliding door that recognizes your needs as a person. It eliminates challenges, not from the game, but from just access to start playing the game. And inclusion comes to mind too, when I think about accessibility, because gamers were not a monolith. Um, we're an incredibly diverse group of people 
And with accessibility, you're including a very large demographic of people. Uh, true that, my friend. Now in accessibility, we hear this phrase. We say, you know, nothing about us without us. I know you heard that a little bit in the Xbox Next Level program. Can you share your thoughts on the part that played for you? I love the Xbox Next Level program. And during my time, I saw the standout focus was accessibility. Um, we're not talking about just getting access to playing these games, but access to guidance, tools, and resources, and even potential partnerships as a creator with a disability. Um, it was it was key that our feedback as creators was brutally honest. Um, that's the only way that we were able to just make the program better. And our group, we had a whole wide range of disabilities and it was ensured that our needs were fit and that future creators that would be in this program, their needs would be fit. And after the program, you know, we still have a, a really tight connection um, with everybody that we met through Xbox and um, we're able to like foster this uh, really good relationship that's, that's gonna be last, long lasting and it ensures that, you know, accessibility is always gonna be something that we talk about. Nice, and I'll, I'll make a public promise here, Mike. I wanna continue to see, hear that brutally honest feedback. It's what makes our accessibility experiences great, the input from our community, and I know your voice is a really active and important one there, so I thank you for that. I also wanna ask you, what's next? What messages do you wanna share with players, future creators, future fans we haven't met? Well, my next step now is that since we have access to the games, um, I want to bring the competitive element to it. You know, I want to bring adaptive esports to the forefront. Um, in a sense that, you know, if you want to have an example, is what the Paralympics are to the Olympics. Um, but the original mission continues, right? To get everybody gaming. And like I always say, when everyone can game, we all win. Mike, thanks for being with us here today. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your journey with us and for being such an active and passionate participant in the Xbox community. It means a lot to us. Thanks. Now at Xbox, you know, we believe that play is a fundamental need, which is why we constantly strive to create more and more welcoming and accessible experiences for billions of players around the world. In the accessibility space, in terms of recent innovation, we've seen things like the addition of accessibility tags to info appearing on games in the store, and this allows our players to filter on the support of certain accessibility features that might be really important to them. It also allows us to spotlight features using these six different tags so that we're really shining a light on games that do an awesome job bringing this type of content to our community of gamers. And for accessibility features on PC or console, we're actually working to improve and we've delivered some improvements on our support channels and sites like support.xbox.com so you know the accessibility features that exist and how to use them. And on the creator side of things, we're developing uh, new innovations there as well that we're directing people to. Things like our Gaming Accessibility Fundamentals Learning Course, a wonderful program to go take. I've taken it myself, I highly recommend it. Or even taking advantage of programs like the Microsoft Gaming Accessibility Testing Service or MGATS, we love our acronyms here at Microsoft. And that couples accessibility validation with players uh, with disabilities giving feedback actually uh, to developers on implementation of those features. So as we close today, I wanna extend an invite to everybody here at the summit to join our community 
and check out the Xbox Ambassador Accessibility Explorer path. Now, ambassadors are players from a wide range of backgrounds that promote safe gaming environments and want to make gaming fun for everyone. And the Accessibility Explorer path provides a fun way to learn about gaming accessibility through activities across PC and console, and also having the opportunity to meet other players who have the same mindset of making gaming fun for everyone. Now we have a goal of 1 million missions accomplished by Global Accessibility Awareness Day on May 18th. So please contribute to the cause and we welcome you to be part of that because as Mike says, and as I love to say, when everyone plays, we all win. All right, back to you, Jenny. One of the goals of Ability Summit is to raise the bar in event inclusion making sure that everything that we do around here, we learn from every year. And we've learned a lot, but there's still a lot. And every single year, we raise that bar. To explore what this journey has been like and where we still need to go, we're going to turn the camera on ourselves. In fact, we're going to have, well, the amazing leader of our events team here, Bob Bajan, and Donna Zarka, who is the Accessibility Director of Technology. She runs the whole ship on my team. Bob, Donna. Take it away. Thank you, Jenny. So, Bob, yes. thank you for letting me corral you for five minutes Great to have to a here. Donna function. has brown hair and is wearing um, a blue and yellow patterned for dress. For a long time now, and I've been so impressed with how much effort you all put into to making sure these inclus events are inclusive and reach as many people as possible. Yeah. Right. You are constantly experimenting, constantly learning. And every time I'm in here in this studio, things have changed. So <laughs> things have changed. So tell us about that. How does it all start? Bob is wearing well, I mean, glasses and a black jacket. I think at the foundation level of it, I think there's this relationship between kind of three sides of a triangle. One is that from the inception of the brief process, right? Right from the very beginning of making any of these experiences, you've got to have experts involved, right? There's got to be people that are of the audience that you're speaking to. Um, and, that, and that's especially true with accessibility, right? Because I think for so many of us, it's easy to miss these things or not even be thinking. Our awareness is still so low, right? In the evolution of getting good at this. And so having people in that process all the way to the beginning, foundational. The other thing is this, is this ongoing dialogue with the audience itself, right? The attendees that are coming to these shows and giving you feedback. And you've just got to be this kind of constant listening vessel to take that all in and really, you know, kind of hear it and absorb it and process it. And then I think the last piece, which maybe is the most important and the hardest to do, and that is, is as an organization, as a team, as individuals on that team, the ability to keep knowing that you're, no matter how good we get, we will always be doing things wrong. Mm -hmm. And then the willingness and the courage to kind of not be defensive and just go, that was wrong. Okay, what do we need to do to make that better and make that change? And so this combination of people involved from the very beginning, listening to the audience constantly and having the kind of internal strength to kind of say, yep, blew that one. <laughs> you know, what do we need to do to get better? I think that really is the combination that we're working on all the time. And that lines up with the disability and accessibility community's entire thing about nothing about us without us. And I love seeing all of you live that and just how you do the event productions, not just for ability, but I've seen this for Build, I've seen this for Ignite. You know, you and I have known each other a long time. <laughs> and back in 2005, when I did my first Microsoft presentation. You were 12 then. Oh my gosh. Um, and honestly, Things, we were holding stuff together with like duct tape and a dream and like two goats and a horse, right? Um, we've come a long way. True. And in 2020, we flipped from completely in person to completely virtual in like, what, two months? Mm -hmm. That was chaos and pandemonium. And then now we've settled at this newest normal, the latest normal of hybrid. So I would love to learn what are some of the lessons and learnings that all of you have picked up along the way regards to accessibility? Well, I mean, it's just like this ongoing treadmill of learning, right? <clears throat> but I think 
you know, you look at something when we moved into the pandemic period, like the town hall meetings, mm -hmm. for example, this thing that was very analog, mm -hmm. right? In the, in the cafeterias, hundreds of people sitting there. We shot it like television, mm -hmm. but, you know, things like the, lang the ASL language being incorporated into that show was as simple as putting somebody on the side of the stage doing that translation into that language. But then all of a sudden now we're completely digital and now what do we do? And how do we create that event in a digital way and incorporate that screen into the experience in a way that works and is in you know, in harmony with the content that you're delivering and that kind of thing. Which led us to the next level, which was, you know, how do we deal with now closed captions in that digital world? And how do we change those languages and make that easy to do? And what's that change? And then, you know, of course, we very quickly got into the next level of it, which was like, how do we do, you know, audio visual descriptions and that kind of thing? And how does that work? And do, are we making the speakers stop and wait for those descriptions? Or how, you know, how is all of that going to work together? And then, of course, we evolved and got into just audio descriptions and combining them in a way that made sense. And then we got into this idea of toggling. So mm -hmm. ASL on or the language ASL off, you know, closed captions on, off, so that we really could, if you wanted to be very focused and just watch the show and you could and that was enough for you, you could do it that way or whatever pieces you needed. And so, again, I think it's not, it's not like this very rigorous, singular way but it is about this kind of a, an approach and an attitude and I think a posture, a learning posture, listening, that really is the common thread through it all. I can see that, right? And your audience can see that in real time because you are very consciously making sure everyone have the options they need to have the best possible experience. And your neurodivergent friends such as myself, thank you because at first we're like, hmm, there's a lot of information on the screen. And I love the options, but being able to not have them is one of the best options of all. <laughs> so I, I do appreciate that. So I have a funny story for you. When I first started presenting with you all virtual in the studio, I don't know if you remember the flying machine. So I called it. Uh, the flying machine would come at we, me with words on them. So the flying word machine. People would say, OK, Donna, go ahead and read it in real time. And I'd say, I'm dyslexic. I don't read words well, much less flying words who are coming at me. <laughs> and I love that your team was able to co-create with me even back in the day in real time, just like that. They switched, they said, okay, this machine will not fly at you. It's going to, you're gonna have a confidence monitor right near you, your entire script on that. A second monitor, which is how we're doing it here today, um, with just your words and the keywords being piped into your ear. And that worked for me. And while it was super customized, We've been doing that for all other dyslexic folk who've been coming into mm -hmm. the studio, and they've been actually giving me feedback, saying, how do they know how to put on a conference with dyslexic speakers? I'm like, because they co-created. They didn't make stuff up, they co-created. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate that. So, you know, not every event has the resources to put on a production like what we have here with extra monitors, even flying monitors, teleprompter operators. Many of our customers, you know, we have a billion and a half Microsoft customers all over the world. Many of them want to do events, whether it's a local meetup or, you know, 50 people in a virtual event. What are some pieces of advice you would give them? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to these very human things we were talking about earlier. In so many ways, kind of accessibility is kind of less about the tech and much more about the intention, right? And I think the intention and then expressing that intention in an event goes so far, right, in terms of really bringing people in. So, I mean, I think the first thing is, is that you can do that is very low cost is, is get people involved, you know, from the community mm -hmm. in the process, as we were talking about earlier, in the building of and the making of, because, and harness that creativity, right? Because, um, you know, the, even though you may be very limited from a budget perspective or from a capabilities perspective, you know, if you get, cre you know, you get great people that have some kind of empathy and understanding, Solving that problem creatively, you know, great things come from that. Um, and then I think the second thing is, is, you know, to the extent that the event is experiential, it is an event, there are presenters, you know, in the thing. Making sure that you, again, put people on that stage, in that panel, you know, in the experience, you know, in the hosting of it, um, that all people can see themselves. Right. And I think there's no cost in that. Right. It doesn't cost anything. And it, and it goes, 
And it, it pays enormous dividends. And so there's some really very kind of simple things to do there. Then, then I think the third thing is, is the technology you do choose, you know, the platforms you do choose. You think about, you know, what we do at Microsoft Teams, for example, you know, we use that as a incredible kind of showcase of what we're capable of in terms of placing that there. Um, you know, th that is another great opportunity for you to make a choice that can maximize the accessibility of the programs that you're, that you're building and pursuing, whether it's 25 people in a room or it's 2,000 people in a ballroom. No, that's really true. Um, that is the reality for so many of our customers. And I love that we've spent a lot of effort saying, how can we make teams more accessible to, yes, the disability community, but to anyone else who might be tuning into a virtual event? Yeah. Um, I love that you brought up the concept of why it's important to have diverse speakers. Not just because it's good to have diverse speakers, but you actually will have a much more diverse and included in the audience if you have the organizers and the speakers have a wide variety of lived experience. So thank you on behalf of the neurodivergent community, the disability community, and generally our entire global communities, you know, 1.5 plus billion people who we serve. So I really appreciate that. Um, so what's next for event inclusion? What do you think? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I think, look, it's, just, it's the never ending loop, yeah. right? We're a hamster on a wheel in that regard. I, I will say one thing though, that I think is very important about in this particular event. We so look forward to doing this every year. And I think the biggest reason is, is I think we look at this check-in, this, the Ability Summit, as the raising of the bar each year. You know, wh how, where, what can we do, what more can we do? Where can we go next? What's the next level of iteration um, and innovation in these areas? And so the, the relationship we have between the show itself and the way we build it, and then the conversation we have with the audience it's just so incredibly important. So what's next is listening to how this show goes and what people say back um, really is the n most important next step. And then taking that as the, as the baseline for where we go uh, in the coming year. I love that. That is so good that Ability Summit is the baseline. We get to go first, set, you know, this is, this is where we're at and all other events kind of have to match this level of inclusion. That is fantastic. I love it. Thank you so much. Donna, it's great. Great talking with you. You too. I guess we're going back to Jenny. I think so. It's all to you now, Jen. Thank you, Bob and Donna. Jenny's wearing a black t-shirt. It says, nothing about us I without us. Loving all of the emojis that you're hitting uh, while you're in the chat window. But we also know, and we've heard your feedback, about us shouting at you in all caps um, with the subtitles. We are working on it. Keep the feedback coming in. I know that if you've got additional feedback, there is a survey to let us know. That could be good, bad, or ugly. We want it all because one of our key missions with the Ability Summit is to raise the bar in event inclusion, like you just heard from Bob and Donna. But before we close, I do want to take a, a look at a couple of the posts on social. And again, thank you to everyone for popping your thoughts out on the hashtag Ability Summit. I love this one from Jeremy Sinclair. The more I read and I'm exposed to what others experienced of Judy Human, the more I tear up. It takes an amazing person to fight for disability rights like she did. As a vocal ADHD developer, it's making me think about what I and there's an asterisk either side of that I can do out here. And there was this one from Jess Pagan. Do you know at GitHub Copilot understands multiple spoken languages? During college, my code kept breaking and a professor pointed out it was because of a title in a comment because I wrote it in Spanish. Thank you to Black Girl Bytes for demoing inclusion in code. I know there's a lot more. And trust me, I'm going to be all over social media and highlighting some of those great pieces, comments, and feedback that you have. One last reminder, keynote and breakout contents, all nine breakouts, will be available on demand for you to engage with at your own leisure and at your own pace. And if you missed anything, you can go right back to it and you can check it out at any time. Please continue the conversation. Remember that one of our key goals is to accelerate and advance together, together in partnership. And so as we come to a close, we are at a unique juncture in history. Some might call it an uncertain time, particularly 
for minorities, like people with disabilities, although I don't think we're a minority, by the way. So now, more than ever, I want you to challenge yourself and everyone around you to raise that bar, to find joy, to find meaning, to find those problems and solve them. The possibility is creating that more accessible, equitable, inclusive future that empowers everyone across the spectrum of disability from what you can see and what you cannot. Remembering that most of disability, you cannot see. I'm incredibly grateful to everyone for joining us today, to the 70 speakers that have been talking on the stage, to this amazing crew, which you can't see, but trust me, there's a whole gang in this room and the room behind that have been powering this event, listening to every piece of feedback as we've gone through today and smiling occasionally. And of course, I want to say to all of you, thank you for investing your time. That is your asset. Thank you for engaging with this content. I want you to pick up at least one piece of what you heard today and explore it further and take it to action and do something with it. Whether it's in people, partnership, policy, or technology, go try that piece of code. Go try that search in the new thing. Why we continue to push these boundaries is because it matters. It's because accessibility is fundamental and it's a right. And because Judy and many others would want us to be feisty, strong, brave, and courageous. Our main show is now coming to a close. For all of the softies out there, I want you to hang on the line because the Ability Awards are coming up. This is us internally recognizing teams that are doing great work so that we can learn from them and we can accelerate within the company. Be sure to click over for that show. But in the meantime, I'm Jenny Lay Flurry. It has been an honor to be with you today. And I cannot wait to connect with you at the next Microsoft Ability Summit. Take care. Ability Summit. Thank you for participating. There's more to experience. Explore other content experiences in the top navigation bar. In animation, an L-shaped curve of rounded fabric squares undulates softly.